Glad to be back here, glad to uh, be invited and have this opportunity to talk to you all. So what I'd like to do is basically take you through a case study on the audience optimization of digital advertising. Um, so I really want to get a little bit into the details of what exactly happens, and I want to focus on a number of different topics as I go through it. Uh, this audience optimization of digital advertising, the, the, the whole point of it is we have the opportunity to serve advertisements to enormous volumes of people, and we want to be able to identify the subset of people that are going to uh, be most influenced by an advertisement. So how do we, how do, we do that? So I'm going to talk today about the scale of the data, of the models, of the decisions that we're making. I'll talk about the overview from a context and problem definition. I always like it when you get a little bit more context up front around what the heck is this for, right? What's the actual application? How does it work? I'll take you through the process at a pretty high level, um, you know, staying to generalities around how it works. I'll mention some of the details, uh, but I can't go through all of the details in this shorter period of time. And then we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on visualization. I'm a huge believer in it. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of why I uh, am a huge fan of visualization and some examples of how we visualize this massive system. And then finally, I'll cover the technology stack that we use to actually make it all happen. So first on scale, um, you know, to begin with, we process over one terabyte of structured data every single day. Um, so it's a large volume, about three billion transactions um, that we're processing. Beyond that, it's very diverse data. So we're literally working with dozens of different fundamental types of data sources. And we're integrating those data sources together to create a single unified view of the consumer. Um, we do that across around 250 million stable users. We're building predictive models. We're trying to identify who is going to take a specific action. We're building thousands of those predictive models every week. So every time we build one of these models, it lasts at most a week and we rebuild it. We're working with thousands of different advertisers driving these campaigns. So we're constantly in an entirely automated fashion having to build all of these models. We're making 200 billion user level predictions every day. So we have all of these models. We've got 250 million users. We need to update the state of the system every day to improve the targeting for that day. That requires re-predicting about everyone that we track with every single model. So not only is there a lot of this big data, big complexity in how we build the system, um, but we also have to process an enormous amount of data in real time. We get about 30,000 uh, requests for data at peak in a given second and have to respond back all within 200 milliseconds or else you're just purely losing opportunities to monetize an impression. We're also building hundreds of different visualizations and using that to constantly track the state of this system and what's working and what isn't working. Um, those visualizations are all produced daily. They're distributed within the organization. They're distributed to clients. And then the people within data science are using those visualizations to really understand what, what is happening in the system. So a little bit of overview and context for what the problem is that we're addressing. Um, so if you think about digital advertising, there's basically three different constituencies. There's the publishers who are generating the content, the audience who's browsing the content, and the brands that want to reach that audience with a specific message. So you know, the audience goes to a browser, and the publisher puts their content into the browser. And the publisher signals to their ad server through the browser that, hey, here's an opportunity to serve some advertisements. The brand is working with an agency to create a campaign, and they have an ad server themselves that says, here's my creative, here are the targeting uh, that I want to execute for that creative. This is the number of impressions that I want to deliver. And historically, in the beginning, you know, this was all done direct from publisher to advertiser. You had to go out and sell your inventory if you were uh, the New York Times directly all of the time. What Collective does is to sit in the middle of that connection and be able to optimize how an advertiser is connecting to an individual publisher on an impression by impression basis. It's very, very valuable when you've got you know, thousands or tens of thousands of brands on one side and tens of thousands or millions of properties on the other, right? Having them all form direct connections is impossible. So we're you know, sitting there in the middle trying to optimize this process and are using the cookie to track individuals. We've done it historically, predominantly in display and video online, but increasingly are doing it in connected TVs, tablets, and mobile devices. So basically, anywhere where you can control the advertising experience in real time, there's an opportunity to do audience targeting. So what does it really look like? So on one side, we've got thousands of brands 
that are executing campaigns. On the other side, we've got 250 million stable users. And what we want to do is create this system, audience optimization, that's linking the two together in order to identify individuals that are likely to convert, and so you should serve them an advertisement, uh, that are going to be more likely to engage with the advertisement, so they're going to somehow be affected by it or um, uh, produce something because of the advertisement, or people who are going to have their minds changed uh, by the advertisement, which would be brand lift. To give you a sense of what it looks like, if you drew connections between one out of a million of the users, and just one out of 10 of the brands, these would be the actual lines of assignment that we're making on a given day. Uh, so it's not necessarily a visualization that you look at and you go, aha, OK, now I really understand it. But I think it helps you wrap your head around the complexity of what's happening. Right? How do you make all of those assignment decisions every single day in an optimal fashion? So this is the process. We start with what we call our audience cloud. It's a stable set of 250 million users. These are people that we've seen multiple times over the past 28 days. So if we actually look at the total number of users that we track, it's in the billions. And we boil that down to just those users that are likely to be persistent. Because otherwise, you know, what are you going to do with them if they're not going to appear again? Right? We then identify the target audience. So what is the conversion that they want to have happen? We place a pixel on that conversion page so that we can identify people that are doing it. Or we track who's actually engaging with an advertisement. Um, or who's responding from, the, from, from an advertisement to you know, generate increased brand lift. So that's the target seed data. The most important piece is assembling what we call the model matrix. It's literally thousands of features available on every single user. This is a visualization I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but it's a rendering of what that looks like for a very small sample of users. Uh, so imagine, right, this is a, a giant uh, matrix that's fairly sparse uh, that we have that has literally 250 million rows and thousands of columns. We then build predictive models using machine learning, right? So we have all of this predictive data. We've got the target that we want to optimize towards. Uh, we tend to use uh, something called elastic nets, so regularized linear, uh, generalized linear models. Uh, they perform very well at scale with sparse data. We then score every single user in the cloud. Right? So we take a given advertiser's predictive model, and we rank everyone from least likely to do something to most likely to do something, um, and then can pull just the top n users, dependent upon what the objectives are of the campaign, how much they want to deliver in the next day. So we can identify the 5 million users that are most likely to engage with an ad, or the 5 million users that are most likely to convert for an advertiser. And then we can adjust that size daily to optimize delivery and performance. And then, like I said earlier, you know, we're re rebuilding these models every single week. And we'll even rebuild them daily if it's warranted. So that's the nature of the problem. And uh, you know, visualization is something I believe uh, an enormous amount in. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about visualization before I dive into some of the examples. So you know, the question is, why, why visualize? Why spend so much time on this? So first and foremost, I think visualization helps you to build intuition. Intuition about the data itself, the process generating the data, intuition about the system that you're building and how the system is functioning. Without that visualization, when you have you know, billions of data points, right, how do you better understand the domain? You can ask people questions. You can study schematics. Um, but only through data can you really gain a deep understanding of what's really happening. You can find errors. So when you've created a system like this that a massive organization relies on to generate huge amounts of revenue, you don't sleep so well at night if you don't know if it's working or not. right? And so it's very tough when you've got literally hundreds of different steps you're taking each day to execute a system, all of which are very complicated, executed in different systems, to know that the damn thing works. Right? So a lot of the visualizations we create are designed to ensure that it's working correctly and be able to monitor the performance of the system. Finding outliers. You know, that's something that anytime you do any work with big data or a system that's making many decisions, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong tomorrow probably 50 times. Right? If you're doing 3 billion things tomorrow, you know, something incredibly rare is going to happen quite often. Uh, so being able to find outliers and bound them and understand them, protect against them, throw warnings, you know, all that's very important. It starts with visualization. That's how you start to find out what could potentially be going wrong on the edges. And then finally, selling the science. Uh, so selling it internally, making sure all of the different you know, business units that might rely upon this technology believe in it and are actually going to use it. Selling it externally to clients so that they come back and give you more money later. Uh, visualization is incredibly powerful at telling stories around these things. 
My favorite resources, I know we've already talked about some of these today, you know, Tufti, just in terms of getting an understanding of the aesthetics of visualization and how to do it well, I think is a fantastic book to start with, this visual display of quantitative information. Um, and then, of course, the Wickham libraries, so ggplot and R and uh, plyr and R are incredibly powerful tools for creating visualizations. I think somebody said it earlier on the panel, my life was changed when I discovered these things. It took me you know, three hours to generate a visualization that now I could generate in three minutes and iterate very, very quickly, well, I think which is incredibly important. If you really want to discover the true story in the data, you have to take a lot of different swipes at it. So these are some examples of the types of visualizations that we generate within this system. Um, so you can see there's a pretty wide array of different flavors of visualization. I'm going to take you through these just to give you an example of what they really are and talk about them some. Uh, you already saw the one in the center, the matrix connection. Um, so I won't cover that one again, but I'll cover the others. So let's start um, with this, a very simple time series visualization. This is for a specific campaign. It's for a video game conversion campaign. And so it was actually a sports video game. So this advertiser wanted to find people that were likely to buy this video game and narrow the advertising to just those people. So what we can do with the time series and report this back to the client is show by day, because this is a daily time series, the total number of impressions delivered and performance on this vertical axis, the percentage of the people that impressions were delivered to that went on to purchase the video game. You look at it and you go, OK, great. It's a bunch of dots with a wiggly line in it. I don't really know what to make out of it. That's the power of having the control group embedded into everything that we do. Um, so I really liked the earlier uh, presentation by the, the gentleman from NYU uh, about causal inference, something I'm a, a huge believer in. Being able to do experiments at scale is incredibly important. Uh, every time we build one of these optimized pools, we'll select 5% of the users and ensure they're selected entirely at random. So after the system is actually put into production and ads are being delivered, we can see are they being delivered to the test or the control group, and therefore generalize that whatever difference there is in behavior is because of that audience selection. Now, you, could, you can go you know, so further, does this actually tell you that the advertising caused them to buy the product? And it doesn't. You have to do something more sophisticated to get there. We actually have two different technologies that works on that. So first is dynamic creative optimization, where you control the creative dynamically and can actually serve to certain subset of users uh, a static creative image. And then to other users, serve dynamic creative images that are selected based upon their attributes. And you can then test by observing differences over time to see whether or not that change in creative actually influenced people's behavior. Did they do something different? We can also identify which audiences are most receptive to advertising by doing a similar experiment where we hold out a set of users. Um, and uh, we've got a whole paper called Causal Attribution that's, that's about that. So it's, it's, a, it's an exciting thing to do. Let's dig deeper into this example. I think it's kind of fun to see, well, who is this audience really? So it's a video game, a sports video game, uh, people that are buying that. And the first thing we look at is income. Well, surprise, surprise, you know, lower income, more likely to purchase a sports video game. You know, as you make more money, you have less time to play video games. You know, that, that's what happened to me. <laughs> if you look at age, they're much more likely to be young. Right? That's not too surprising either. As you get older, your reflexes get poorer, you perform worse, you get beat by your cousin or your nephew, and then eventually your children, and you, you say, I'm never going to play them again. Right? So that's my causal story behind, behind age. Um, they're more likely to be male. OK, well, surprise, surprise, it's a sports video game after all. Let's look at what types of content they read online. They're more likely to read about games and music, technology, science, gadgets, but they're not reading about religion or real estate travel, sports, or weather, they don't go outside, right? They're not reading about shopping or finance because they don't have any money, right? <laughs> what are they buying? They're buying electronics and entertainment and computers because, wow, that's what you need to play video games. But they're not buying autos because they couldn't afford them, tools, they wouldn't know what to do with them unless they're screwdrivers, right? You've got to get into the case and make adjustments. Or senior products because that would just be weird, right? I mean, that's <laughs> completely, completely against this uh, idea of who this audience is. Um, so it's interesting to see this. This is you know, not what the model is doing, right? The model is taking thousands of different features and weighting them dynamically to be able to score all 250 million users. This is just a view into that audience that was selected. How are they different from a random audience? And it starts to either confirm your preconceived notion 
about who the audience is or who's responding to an advertisement, or it goes against it and you learn something different. Uh, there's a lot of strategies in advertising that says, well, I know that it's young males that are low income that are reading about games that are going to buy my product. So I'm going to go find those people and serve them advertisements. Sounds great, but in theory, it doesn't work so well. Even if you combined those four different attributes, maybe you would get 100% lift, 150% lift. Very difficult to do that at scale. By doing this predictive model on that prior time series, we had over 800% lift. Right, by being able to zone in on just that audience in this very complex multivariate way. So let's talk a little bit about you know, the visualizations behind the scenes. So this is a, a favorite of mine uh, that is a visualization of the model matrix where we take on the left side um, a sample of about 1,000 of the 250 million users and then across the top plot all the features. Each dot is the indication of a point of data for one of those users. The different colors are different types of data, right? I talked about these 12 different sources. So we've integrated them all together in a single consistent format. This is a visualization that, again, it's not necessarily when you go at and you look at it, is it good, is it bad? Do I know necessarily what to do differently from it? No. But I think it gives me, at least, a much better intuitive understanding of what is the data that I'm really working with? How is it distributed? How sparse is it? Um, and it's pretty, right, which is kind of nice as well. Um, this is a visualization that's uh, much more useful. So again, we're building these thousands of models with thousands of features. How do you visualize the coefficients? Um, it can be very difficult to do. Um, so one way that I think works really well is these bubble charts, where green means a positive coefficient, red means a negative coefficient. And then you can line up along one dimension different models, and along another dimension different features and pretty quickly see trends around you know, different features activating in different ways for different types of models. It turns out that for this, these features are time of day that a user is browsing. Um, and the different models are for different types of products. And so some of the models much prefer users that are browsing early in the morning. Right? Surprise, surprise, probably a video game. You know, other models maybe are, are, are really preferring people that are browsing in the middle of the day, which might be going after people that are uh, you know, moms right? um, with uh, baby products or something like that. Others are looking at people that are, are browsing late in the evening, which is a completely different audience. So this is you know, one sort of small bit of data that you can start to look at and get a more intuitive understanding of how are the models really using it. This is another visualization that then wraps on top of that how important is all of the data. So it's a difficult question to answer, especially at scale. You can do things like drop terms in order to see if the models got significantly worse when you pulled data out. It's really, really computationally intensive. If you're building thousands of massive models a week, you, you just can't do it. So this is a technique where we actually look at how much does the assignment change if you take the, the, this, the type of data out. And so it's an approximation of a drop term. It's not quite perfect, but it actually gives pretty good intuition. And you can see that there are some feature groups, so some of the sources of data that are much, much more important than others. But there are often individual models that might require a single source of data that nobody else really cares about um, and find a lot of value in it. So there's an interesting amount of uh, diversity. You know, this is probably one of the most useful visualizations for us. If you knew what those feature groups were, Right, which I'm not going to tell you, I'm sorry. But if you knew what they were, you would know where to invest more effort and energy in data collection and processing and structuring and all of the things that you would want to do to improve the system. So the technology stack that we're using, there's a, a whole range of things that have to be done, starting with logging. So we use Flume uh, to log and manage all of the transactions that we're seeing every day. We use Hadoop to do a lot of pre-processing. So a lot of the data comes in unstructured, and you have to create structured information out of it. You have to combine logs together. Um, so it's relatively simple, straightforward things done on raw logs. We use Netiza, which is a appliance, a high uh, performance appliance that basically is SQL based, um, but uses some exotic hardware to be able to do things like joins and aggregates really, really fast. It's kind of expensive, but if you work with enough structured data and want to do enough joins and aggregates, uh, it becomes quite worth it compared to Hadoop. The model build is executed within R, distributed on top of Hadoop. The scoring is done back in Netiza, so the coefficients are exported out of these R Hadoop distributed jobs, put into Netiza, and then we use user-defined functions that execute it within Netiza. 
All the visualizations, predominantly in R, but we're increasingly using Tableau to make the visualizations more interactive and distribute them out to individuals within the organizations. There's then a lot of work done with the assignments in Scala on HBase, preparing to make all of these decisions around who should be served what ad. And then finally, the actual serving, we store all of the assignments in Redis, which is an in-memory key value store. And then are using Node.js, it's a really, really fast way of rendering JavaScript to be able to actually insert those into the browser to be able to exchange with the RTB or the ad server that's using the data. So that's it. Um, I'll make the uh, pitch that, of course, we're hiring. Surprise, surprise. Uh, you know, I, I run uh, products and data sciences and engineering, and we're hiring in all of those. Uh, fields looking for great people. Um, a lot of really exciting things to do. And I think one of the most valuable things is that it's incredibly important for the organization. You know, it's not something done on the side. This is a key part of how a, a big, fast growing company makes money. Um, so it's exciting to be at the very center of what drives value in an organization. And with that, I'm a minute over. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stop. Thank you.